Hello, hi, and welcome to another episode of The Emma Gunn Show. I am your host, Emma Gunn Awardner, and um, this episode is the first of the December dailies, my beloved Christmas pods, where I will be publishing a podcast every day throughout December 2019, and as promised, I'm kicking off with a doozy. Well, it's a doozy for me. I've got butterflies and it's something I've wanted to tell you about for months, but I also wanted to put a little bit of distance between me doing this and telling you about it so that when I did tell you about it, I could add as much value as possible to this particular topic, conversation, and of course, to you. So (laughs) on July 23rd this year, I had a press reduction And it's something I have been wanting to do for ages. And by ages, I mean probably 20 years, ever since a friend of mine at university told me about hers. So yes, earlier this year, I had my, I went, I had surgery and I had my breasts reduced. And there are some things to say that I want to say right at the top of the show that I think are incredibly important to, important to get out of the way. Not get out of the way, I think they're important to address. The first is that I've mentioned breast reductions and the fact I have wanted one in passing a few times on this podcast, and it generates three types of response from you, my most excellent listeners, and I want to address all of those right now. There are those listeners who have done it who message me to encourage me to do it because it's the best thing they ever did and they understand why I would like to, why I wanted to do it. And they believe I'll feel the same way after I do it, that I'll feel great. And those messages and that kind of support is, is just utterly wonderful. So thank you to every single person who sent me a message along those lines. It meant so, so much to me. And there are those listeners who would love to have it done, who asked me to document it and to share my experience if I ever do have the surgery. Like I was, they are scared or worried about general anaesthetic and major surgery and want to hear from someone who has been through it. And then there are the listeners who have had to have surgery on their breast because of cancer. And I really want to address this last one because this wasn't a decision I made lightly, trust me. My mother had breast cancer in 2013 and had surgery on both breasts as part of her treatment and it was a huge factor in why I shied away from having it done for such a long time. In fact, I went for a consultation with a breast surgeon about five or six years ago, five years ago, it was after my, after my mother's experience and, um, nearly had a panic attack in the waiting room because the surgeons who do breast reductions and breast augmentations also do reconstructive surgeries and remove cancer. And it was all a little too raw and a little too familiar in the wrong way. And I parked it because it was just upsetting. I don't want to disrespect anyone who has been through this or who is going through it, but I do want to tell a story and I hope you don't mind that I do. I actually wasn't 100% sure about making an episode about this, although for full disclosure, I had had conversations about having the surgery for free in exchange for coverage earlier on in the year. Coverage meaning talking about it on the podcast, creating IGTV, etc, etc. But that didn't happen. And once I decided to go ahead, under the radar as it were, meaning I was paying for it, it seemed a bit self-indulgent. But it was to, to then say, guess what I did, guys? But it was the messages from people saying that if I ever did it, they'd love me to document it that made me think about creating this episode. Additionally, I tell you guys everything. So it's actually been really weird doing this and not telling you. (laughs) It's been really odd. And the third reason is because I read a blog post a couple of days before my surgery that scared the shit out of me. And actually, it could have had a really negative effect on my recovery had I not had really excellent care from my surgeon and nurses. So my intention in publishing this episode is to create a place where you can find out the realities of having this via my personal experience, but also in a way that's practical and realistic and balanced. I'm not going to try and scare anybody. I'm not going to say something that I haven't researched or backed up or double checked, if that makes sense. I'm not going to... This blog post I read basically, I'll come onto it later, just suggested that there was a higher risk about something than actually is accurate. And it completely sent my mind... Uh, off on a spiral, which wasn't very positive. So let's get started. There are, as far as I can see, having gone through it now, three pillars, three pillars, three pillars to this story, the practical, the technical, and the emotional. And like any good story, there's a fair bit of crossover, but 
I'm, I'm going to start with the emotional because I think that's where it all started for me, obviously. I think the decision to have surgery in the first place can be a very emotional one. There can also be practical reasons, but it can be very emotional. It definitely was for me. And as I said earlier, it's a decision. It's something I've wanted to do for a very long time, probably over half my life. And that in itself is quite an emotional thing to carry around, wanting to do something and not doing it. Um, I have wanted to get this breast reduction. And at this point, it's worth saying that my breast reduction came with a breast lift, as they often do. So technically speaking, it's a mammoplasty procedure. That's the reduction. And a mastopexy, which is the lift. So I've wanted to get one for a long time. But it's probably more accurate to say that I've wanted smaller breasts. Does that make sense? The fact the route was via surgery was something I think I was in denial about. You know, I wanted smaller perkier boobs, but by magic, not by invasive surgery under a general anesthetic. So, you know, like, oh, I want to lose weight, but I want to keep living my life exactly the same way that I'm living it and not make any changes and still shed the weight. Th that sort of thing, like it, connecting that there was going to be a bit of hard work in the middle was something I was sort of dancing around and hoping that someday someone would magically say, oh no, there's a new lunchtime breast reduction. That's not going to happen. Lunchtime nose jobs are a thing as far as I can understand. But this procedure is never going to be a tablet or like, you know, a non-invasive, you know, on the high street thing. Anyway, even when I was in my teens, I had heavy sagging breasts and it made me feel older. And it made me feel older because that was the kind of thing I heard women my mum's age talking about. And they'd always associate it with, oh, you know, after kids, after I had children. So it kind of came with the territory of being a mum. But I was only a teenager, like seriously, 15, with stretch marked, heavy hanging breasts. And it's worth saying, my weight is obviously an issue in this. I've never been skinny and I had PCOS and there was a lot of weight gain. And with that weight gain came very big boobs. And then with subsequent weight loss, they became empty, heavy and saggy. So there are a couple of things at play here. But even if I hadn't put on the weight, I still had not very nice, saggy, heavy boobs. Simple. And in my adult life, my weight has gone up and down more than once. And it was always a bit of a shock to me that when I am slimmer, although my boobs get smaller, they actually look worse. They look emptier, they look saggier, the stretch marks are more obvious. And so, yeah, the empty, the smaller they are, the emptier they look, the sort of the worse they look in a way, although much easier to stuff and tuck into a smaller cup size, I have to admit. Um, and I also really hated restrictive bras. Like, I remember once last year having to leave Lisa Potter Dixon during a lunch because I was so close to tears from the pain that had been caused by just wearing bras. And I'm going to mention this because if you're thinking about doing this, you might relate to it. So my bra back size should be a 38 because I'm 33 inches around my chest. And I know not everyone subscribes to this measurement system of add four inches if it's an even number and five if it's an odd number. And I don't particularly agree with it, but it's just to give you an idea. But if I wore a 38 back size, the weight of my breast wouldn't be fully supported and it would actually sort of sag. Um, so I ended up, for, I've, so I've been wearing a 34 back, which is tight and restrictive, but that means that they were held. Um, and my back and chest are covered in scars and pigmentation from this. But I know a lot of women with heavy breasts do this. You know, they, you, they choose a smaller band size so that the bra isn't, so that they're not, it's not hanging and it's, they feel like they're supported and they're not weighty. Also, the skin on skin under my breast would get hot and sweaty. <laughs> so sexy and it's quite off-putting to take off your bra and smell musty dampness it's really not very sexy and I had divots in my shoulders from wearing my bra straps tight so my boobs looked higher and please don't get me started on working out and wearing two or three bar bras to minimize bounce so that's just sort of some of the stuff that goes along with having like big heavy boobs and they, they were things I got to a point of being sick of um to give you an idea about how long I've wanted this, it might have been one of the first conversations I ever had with Nadine Baggett back in the early 2000s, before we became proper friends. And that's when she uttered the immortal line, and I am paraphrasing here, you know you need a breast lift when you're having sex doggy style and they start clapping. Which is what probably why I've had sexless relationships for most of my life, but that's for a, <laughs> that's for a conversation with my therapist. The thing that stood in the way of me getting surgery, or the things I should say, were in no particular order, money, this is not an inexpensive procedure, fear, it is a two, or it's more likely a three hour operation under general anaesthetic and it can involve an overnight stay in hospital, a personal inability to make big decisions without a committee or being told I'm making the right decision and nothing will go wrong by someone else. 
So let's deal with money because that's pretty practical. In my case, I was squirreling away money for this for years. And I mean years, like probably about eight years since just before I went freelance. I was like, well, I'm squirreling money away. And in the back of my mind, I was like, it's either going to go on boobs or, you know, a house. It was never an option for me to apply to have this done on the NHS because my breasts weren't causing me a type of pain or discomfort that justified surgical intervention. But then I do want to sort of flag up a little something about the cost of my surgery. One of the great things about working in the industry I do is that I have friends and colleagues who know the best surgeons for um, surgery, obviously, the be- who the best surgeon is for this, who the best surgeon is for that, who the best esthetician is for this, who the best esthetician is for that. And being the best comes with a premium um, and they're London based. So my surgery was definitely at the top end cost wise because I solicited advice from mates about who to go to. But I figured the cost of shopping around and paying consultation fees to a handful of surgeons outside London to see who I liked, whose work I was impressed by, whose before and afters I was ha- like thought would look good, would end up costing as much as the difference in cost for the surgeon I eventually went with. Plus, I also just thought, really, you're going to try and penny pinch on this surgery? You're going to try and save a bit of money on something so major? And I just decided, I just decided to spend the money on it. Uh, But like I said, I've been squirreling away that money for a long time. Realistically, in the UK, the surgery, depending on where you go, where you live, surgeon, etc., uh, consultation fees, all the like, it's probably likely to cost between six and ten thousand pounds, just to give you a ballpark. When searching for a plastic surgeon, I think this is very important to say uh, to perform a breast reduction or breast surgery. Make sure you choose one that is a member of. BAPS, yes, B-A-A-P-S, and BAPS, yeah, that is what it's called, or BAPRAS, so B-A-A-P-S, which is the British Association of Aesthetic Plastic Surgeons, and BAPRAS, B-A-P-R-A-S, the British Association of Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgeons, are the two leading societies for plastic surgeons in the UK. And surgeons belonging to these societies get regular training updates, their skills are basically up to date, and how to deal with patients all of that but I will come on to how to find a surgeon in just a moment because let's just deal with the other things that can stand in the way of even making the decision in the first place so let's deal with fear before the operation my mind was completely consumed with fear so much so I didn't actually tell a single person I was having the surgery because I didn't want anybody or any I didn't want anything to come between me and the surgery happening I I was that and I knew that it would just take one look or something for me to begin to chicken out. Um, I don't advise doing this, by the way. It was incredibly irresponsible of me not to tell someone. And I would like to take this opportunity to publicly apologise to my brother for putting him down as my next of kin on my hospital admission, but not actually telling him I was going in for the procedure. In fairness, when I did tell him, his response was, I don't answer my phone if I don't recognise the number and I never, and I never listen to my voicemail. So good luck with that. So, OK, thank goodness nothing went wrong. Also, you know me well enough to know now that I've got a bit of an obsession with being self-sufficient and not needing anyone, which is something we can we can unpick in the podcast in 2020 and also privately in intense therapy. So what I have to say now about the, the fear is that of all the things involved in having the surgery, the thing I delegated to an expert was the thing I was most fearful of, the operation and immediate recovery and care in hospital. So actually, once I decided who my surgeon was, my fear should have eased. And that's the advice I'd give anyone now. Rationally speaking, I was putting myself in safe hands, some of the safest. So my fear should have subsided. But obviously, I was scared, terrified, in fact, up until the second I went under. But now when I think about it, it's the thing that occupies the least amount of real estate in my thoughts about having had the surgery. It really, really does. Obviously, it's right to be scared. But... It's the thing that I I just, it doesn't even cross my mind now, apart from when I think, gosh, I really was scared, wasn't I? The worst bit, honestly, is the anticipation, like the knowing that it's going to happen. And I was very lucky in a sense because I had a very short run up to this surgery. If you remember the podcast in July when I talked about having a breast cancer scare, I talked about the fact the scare had shifted some things into perspective and one of them was to stop sitting on the money and to spend it on the surgery. But I actually did pause on it. Because, you know, life goes back to normal in a sort of weird way. But one morning I woke up at 2am, went into the bathroom, took off my top and looked really objectively at my breasts. And I was really upsetting, actually. I just was crying. I woke up crying about it. I think I'd had a dream about 
about it all because I was psyched up earlier on in the year to have it and then it didn't happen and and there was like obviously all the stuff had gone on in June with the scare and I'd woken up crying I was really stressed about it and I went into the bathroom and I looked at them and I just realized in that moment that I was never going to feel good about how they looked or what I saw when I looked in the mirror. I hated being called busty. I didn't like that my boobs entered the room first. I didn't like that they got commented on. I felt physically ugly because they were so low and because my nipples were so big. And I just had this moment of this situation is only going to get worse because let's face it, gravity is gravity. And the chances were they were only going to get saggier. And actually when I had my consultation with my surgeon, one of the things that was pointed out that really cemented it, the idea in my head that I wanted it was the fact that lift, like doing a lift and a breast reduction was going to change my body shape because I was so top heavy that really you never saw my waist or you never saw my torso. And that would never change with exercise or, you know, obviously with bras, you can sort of do, do some of it. But it was that realization that it wasn't just about changing the breasts. It was about changing the whole sort of a pit, the look of the body, which obviously really appealed to me. Um, and also my breasts were something that in that moment at 2am, I realized I needed to do something about, it really was as simple as that. It's like, if you're waking up crying, (laughs) if it causes you that much, like if every time you take a picture, you're like from, from only from the neck up, like if, if, it's constantly at the front of my mind. So I emailed the surgeon's office where I'd had the consultations earlier in the year and just asked them to send me a full breakdown of costs and their earliest appointment. And they gave me the cost breakdown and asked me to go in for another consultation, which was my third with this surgeon. And as it turned out, there's usually a six to eight week wait, wait, but they were able to fit me in five days later. So thankfully I didn't have that big mental run up And the worst part was that my surgery was in the afternoon. So that morning was quite tense, but we'll get to that later. I just want to sort of mention the, um, I'm going to mention what it's like to go and have a consultation because I do think there's something I would like anyone to know about any surgical conversation. Uh, I'd like anyone who's listening to this to know about having a surgical conversation, particularly with the case of my surgery and the, all the emotional tangles that were involved in like self-loathing of how my body looked and feeling angry and blah, blah, and just not liking them. And I like to give you context. I didn't even like looking in the mirror at all. Like I remember coming out of a, went to a Charlotte Tilbury launch a little while ago and I came out of the loos and I didn't realize the corridor was mirrored and I recoiled because I was seeing myself full length because I'm so used to just looking, not looking directly at mirrors anyway. Um, so all of that is really emotional. And then when you go in for a consultation with a surgeon, when obviously everyone's bedside manner is completely different, but actually it's quite a black and white conversation. And as much as they will accommodate and listen, actually it's quite transactional in the sense of you really want them to have a look at your situation, tell you what they can do, and then ask you if you're comfortable with that. So, and that's only my advice because I think if you want to say to somebody, I'm really upset about the bras that I have to buy, I'm really upset about this, that might be a conversation better had with a friend or, you know, someone you're very close to because that's all completely legitimate. But I don't know as if I felt a little bit, I feel as though actually the best, the getting the best out of that consultation is being quite black and white being right can you do this can you lift this will this happen what are the risks and it's a little bit more sort of transactional and a bit more staccato than um opening up the emotional wounds that you might have with them i hope that i hope that's clear because that's what they do that they're really good at what they do so it's race it's basically for you to find out if they can do for you what you want and they'll tell you really honestly, like every surgeon I've ever spoke to is flipping brilliant. But that's all I wanted to say about the conversation. And also what happens is after you have quite this sort of back and forth and then you get a letter which pretty much sort of very roughly plays it back to you to tell, you know, you said that you've got this, you have. I mean, I remember my letter contained the words heavy and pendulous, I think. And I thought, crikey, yes, that's definitely it's definitely time then. So anyway, um, just a little bit about getting, having an efficient consultation, just keep it black and white. It can be really upsetting. There's a temptation when you, you're sitting in front of the person who can fix it for you. There's a temptation to 
finally feel that emotional relief and I would just say I don't know whether that's the place for it but that's just my experience and I'm just sort of flagging it up to you I am going to talk about what it's actually like on the day of surgery in a little while um, because I'd like to give you a sense of what you can expect but right now let's move on to that third factor standing between me um, and having it done which is my personal inability to make decisions without committee and I'm being very flippant here but there is a point to be made and I just want to say that there's always a reason not to do something And in the case of surgery, there's a very obvious, glaring reason not to do it. It's high risk. It's a risky procedure. And we will come on to the reality of the risks and the what can go wrongs involved. But I personally had reached that place in my head and my heart where I wanted what was on the other side of the surgery more than I wanted to not take the risk. So that's a lot of the emotional. So let's get on to the technical. And by technical, I mean basically what's going to happen in the surgery which as I've said you delegate to an expert and also I'm going to keep this very top line because the person you should be hearing this from is your surgeon not from me but essentially the techniques vary it might include surgery through incisions there might be liposuction to remove excess fat but the method is usually that the surgeon will make an incision around the areola of each breast remove excess breast tissue fat and skin to reduce the size of each breast and then reshape and reposition so the breast is reshaped and the nipple and areola are repositioned i have watched this surgery prior to having had it and it actually put me off having had it and then since having had it i've started watching the surgery because side note my mind wants to complete the circle because it feels very bizarre that there's this thing happened to me and I don't remember it so i've started watching surgeries i haven't got that very far i haven't got very far in yet cuz it, it's a lot it's surgery, but I I do want to get all the way through one for some bizarre reason. Um, In my case, I have scars all the way around my areola because one of the last things I said to the surgeon before going into theatre was, please, for the love of God, please make my nipple smaller. And then then they were like, do you mean nipples or areola? I was like, you know what I mean, (laughs) just perky. (laughs) And then I have a vertical scar from the areola to the base of the breast and then scars which basically follow the same shape as the underwire of a bra. So it resembles an anchor in shape. And again, we'll come on to scars in the post-op part of this podcast because I know that's going to be a big question that a lot of you will have. As we're talking about surgery, let's talk about those risks. I was really, really worried about the risks that in my second consultation, I actually think I said, could I die? No one ethical is going to give a definitive no to that question. They'll point out, I'm sure, that it's highly unlikely, but anyone who says it isn't a risk is someone you should maybe think twice about letting operate on you. That's my personal opinion, but there we are. It's a risky procedure. The risks with any surgery are bleeding, infection, an adverse reaction to the anaesthetic, and in the case of breast reduction surgery... Uh, There's bruising, which is temporary, scarring, loss of sensation in the nipples, which can be permanent, a difficulty or inability to breastfeed afterwards, and a difference in size and shape and symmetry of the surgically altered breasts. Now, I scared myself by reading this blog post that I told you about that talked about someone who died from thrombosis after having had this surgery. And so when I came home that first night, I woke myself up every hour on the hour to walk around and keep moving. I was doing those exercises you see people doing on long haul flights. I was like, oh my God, I've got to move around. And I drank four litres of water a day because there was like advice to stay hydrated. Anyway, it was ridiculous. I, I, but my head was not in a clear thinking space. And I wasn't, I didn't consult any of my friends. I didn't tell anyone because if I'd told Nadine, she would, have, she would have slapped me around the face and said, what are you thinking? So all I would say is, just ask in your consultation, ask what your risk is. Um, your risk of thrombosis, for example, it can be down to a number of factors. So just discuss that with your surgeon. And it's not that it wasn't discussed at some point during my process, I hasten to add. It's just that I read this post, like maybe even the day before, and freaked out and had my mind not been a little all over the place because of the fear, I would have asked that question when I was in hospital. But I think I got to the point of thinking, once I was in, once I'd checked in, I was like, well, pfft. What's the point in asking now? Because am I really going to walk out of here? So know all of those things beforehand. It really isn't a decision to be taken lightly. Know your risks. Ask your surgeon the questions. That no question is silly. Like if it's going to put your mind at rest, if it's going to make you feel more comfortable, ask the question. Ask them to explain and understand what you're getting into. Practical. Let's move on to the practical. And by practical, I mean what you need to know, what you need to do, and what you can expect. 
So we've covered off a lot of what you need to know. So that's cost and what actually happens and the risks involved. But one of the most frequent questions I'm asked is what size did you go for now that I've started telling people I've had it done? And I think there's a lot to be said for just making it very clear that discussing size and actually how even how realistic how realistic it even is to talk about something especially like cup size when you're considering this procedure is probably not the road to go down um when you're trying to discuss with your surgeon what's achievable and my surgeon said this to me very very early on and the truth is I threw the idea of cup sizes out of the window quite quickly because A, every brand, bra style and shape is slightly different in volume if you think about it. So it's not an appropriate metric. And B, I don't think I was wearing the correct bra size to begin with. So I didn't even know where I was starting from. I know I wasn't wearing the right bra size, but, you know, tucking, stuffing, all that kind of stuff. So if this is something you're really considering, you have to think about how much of a reduction you want. And by that, I mean, whether it's a reduction or you want the same volume, but just in a tighter, neater, perkier package. Obviously, there'll be scars, but, you know, they won't be heavy. And I have to admit that I went back and forth on this. Not even back and forth. I didn't know whether I still wanted to still have, like, decent-sized boobs, or whether fundamentally I, what I wanted was to change my body shape a little bit and have smaller breasts. And each time my surgeon asked me the question, I gave quite a dithering answer, And then on the day of surgery, when I was asked, what have you decided about size? Have we all like something like, we know where we are on size, don't we? Or something. I think the adrenaline was actually quite helpful because I blurted out, I don't want to be someone with big boobs. I don't want to look out of proportion because I have a big bum and I don't want to look weird. So I want it to, I want them to fit my body, (laughs) which I understand is quite vague. But again, you delegate to an expert, you delegate to somebody who's been here knows what they're doing and and honestly listeners I couldn't be happier genuinely they are a lot smaller than they were but I love them my surgeon got it so right so right um a side note there's a weird but quite wonderful emotional journey you go on afterwards where you find yourself staring at them in the mirror but especially after the shower when you get changed or just holding them or I do maybe maybe it's just me and it is quite weird when in the recovery when you know you can massage them and you start you sort of get get to know them it's really it's the funniest bizarre thing so anyway so yes really think about what you're trying to achieve and this obviously applies to any aesthetic procedure and that will help you express what you want and any good consultation you'll see lots of before and afters and zone in on them hone in on the one that you want for you and ask whether that's realistic and say oh i like how that's gone from that to that how this this person's gone from that sort of shape shape and size, which is similar to me. I, li- I like that finish better than I like that kind of look. Like, be really specific. Ask to see before and afters. That's really important. So let's talk about the actual day of surgery. So from the practical side of things, you're not, you're not, you're, you're not. You're advised not to have anything to eat six hours before and nothing to drink two hours before and to top, to, sorry, it's my Invisalign, to stop taking anti-inflammatory meds or aspirin two days prior to the surgery so anything that could thin your blood I didn't eat anything for about two days because I couldn't concentrate on anything let alone eating which is very unusual for me for me and I packed a suitcase but (laughs) to give you an idea of how much I was just such such a sort of dawdling fool um I didn't pack any cleanser I packed as a as a nighttime moisturizer I packed a really strong retinol (laughs) And I didn't pack a clean top for the morning. Oh, did I? I well, I definitely wore the same one home, and I can't. I can't remember if there was logic to that or whether I just didn't have another top. And I was. I was shaking the whole time. If you had cut me, I would have bled pure cortisol and adrenaline without a shadow of a doubt. So I arrived at the hospital. I was taken to my room. My nurse Anna checked me in, and then a lovely chap named Mo came round and asked me what I wanted to eat when I came back from theatre. And I couldn't read the menu, I couldn't focus, I couldn't tell him anything, because I was like, well, um, I'm going in for major surgery, so, you know, there are risks involved, I might not make it back. But he was really lovely and guided me, and I think he said the apple crumble was really good for pudding, so I had that. Um, My anaesthetist came in and was great, and we had a very frank chat about what was about to happen, and that was fantastic. Then my surgeon came in, and I was marked up, and I I think that was the worst part. 
I've never been so quiet. I've never not spoken to somebody with such resolve. And by, because by marked up, what I mean is that like my gown was taken off and I was in hospital knickers and I was drawn on with permanent marker. Now, as gentle a touch as was used, and it was very gentle, it's so hard for your brain not to go, that's where they're going to be cutting soon. So actually, just know that's a completely normal response and that permanent marker on your skin don't worry because that really is the most you're going to feel or it certainly was in my case um I had a little bit of a wait between my surgeon coming in and actually going down to theater probably about half an hour 40 minutes um I was reading one of Lindsay Kelk's books (laughs) trying to but I genuinely wasn't taking in a single word and then the anesthetist the anesthetist assistant try saying that with him because I think his name was John he's a very nice man came in and took me down to theatre I walked there we got the lift and it's the weirdest thing because your survival instinct goes danger danger and like there's there's a part of you that's going run but you just have to override it and he said I can tell you're really nervous and I just said look I'm terrified but I want what's on the other side of this more than more than I think I've wanted anything so I'm just let's just do this and he said don't worry that that's a completely correct and appropriate feeling and he was very gentle and sweet we got out of the lift I walked into the theater I hopped onto the bed the anesthetist put a cannula in my hand um and I kept saying holy shit this is so real this is so real holy shit this is so real and then he's I think he said something about I'm gonna put um I'm gonna give you something to calm you down because obviously you're quite tense and then he put the mask over my face, my nose and mouth and said, right, can you take some deep breaths for me? And he said, right, one big one followed by a smaller one. So I did it. And then at some point, for some reason, I feel like in between the breaths, I, Michelle Visage popped into my head. God knows why. Who knows? Um, and I do not remember anything after. I can visualize it right now, taking that shallow breath. I can't remember anything until I woke up three hours later in recovery. I think it was about three hours later. And because I woke up, (laughs) I was like, oh, I made it. And I burst into tears, (laughs) which I feel very, very foolish and silly about now. But my nice nurse, Imar, chatted to me about Love Island and administered morphine. And I did lean over to him and say, is that pure heroin? And he just shook his head and thought, oh, God, not another one. He was really nice to me. But um, I was there for about an hour because obviously I cried, but I also started really shivering, like really shaking, like like teeth chattering and everything. But I was so discombobulated that when I came round, I thought it was six o'clock in the morning or 6.15. And I thought, oh, I know I've got the room, my hospital room until 10. Crivens, okay. And I, I think my surgeon came round and said something about, me going up to my room and I said no 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 I've got to be out at 10 don't worry um my friend's coming which was a lie I was getting an uber and I started like bargaining for like a late checkout or something I can't really remember but hey that's what um that's what pure great morphine does for you um when I did go back to my room I was surprised at how easy it was to move I I obviously didn't feel any pain because I had morphine But when I maneuvered into the bed, I assumed like the nurse looked at me and went, right, hop onto the bed. And I went, don't you need to carry me? And she said, no, just use your arms. And I was really surprised and it was completely fine. I could, and within 20 minutes I got up and I went to the loo um, and the nice nurse Maureen just helped me walk there because I was a bit wobbly on my feet, but like I didn't need any help or assistance. It was just, I was a bit, I couldn't have just bowled over there and like normal, I was just a bit shaky. Then Mo came up with my apple crumble, which was flipping lovely um, and I felt great, genuinely. I have really tried to rack my brains. Like, was I uncomfortable? Was was there any pain? And I don't remember any at all. I took a series of selfies of me to try and like in a hospital gown with the camera, trying to see if I could sort of gauge how small they now were. But other than that, I was having a great time watching TV, eating a bit of food, and scrolling through Instagram. I couldn't sleep though. Um, so my nurse, when she came in at midnight, she said, right, if you're still awake at 2am, we're, we're having a chat. And I, I ended up sleeping, but I think I was up at about five or six. And then another lovely nurse, Dana came in and checked on me. She removed my dressings. My surgeon came in to check everything was as it should be. And he was very happy. So then Dana redressed the wounds. I had a wash and I got a cab home. Simple as that. And honestly, I didn't need any pain relief during the night. So I didn't take any home with me and I didn't need to take anything I actually got on my computer so I think I got home at about 11 30 
I got on my computer, sent a load of emails and edited a couple of podcasts, the ones with Alice Living and Emily Leary. Then I went for a walk in the park and my friend Charlotte came over for dinner. And it's like, it's as simple as that. And Charlotte's arrival brings me neatly onto the prep you need to do before the surgery. So I told you I read a blog post that freaked me out. And when I read it, I assumed I'd be completely helpless when I got home. And believing that I wouldn't be able to open the fridge or cook or anything, I panic bought 30 protein bars and laid them out on my kitchen counter so that I had breakfast, lunch and dinner for 10 days. It's utterly ludicrous when I think about it now. It's like, God's sake, Emma, come on. But the thing that makes me laugh most still is that Charlotte had no idea I had the surgery and I only told her when I went and met her at the station. And she came into my flat and she took one look at the protein bars on the side and said, oh, so you wanted smaller boobs and diabetes, which still makes me chuckle. Um, We went across the road, we got sushi, we had peppermint tea, we had a long chat, we had a lovely evening and it was fine. And that night I woke myself up, I told you about, which was a bit silly. Uh, But for two weeks, around two weeks after the fact, you have to um, sleep propped up for a couple of weeks. That's it. And I wore surgical stockings for a couple of nights, but I found them a pain. And also the the effort, like using my arms and chest muscles to pull them on was just silly because you're told not to stress that area. Showering is a bit odd. Um... When you wake up, you've been very tightly bandaged and you have a surgical garment, which is basically a front fastening crop top bra situation. And to shower, you take that off. And I I used to wear my old sports bra over the top to make sure I sort of there was a barrier between my dressings and the water. And I showered from the waist down with total ease every day. And then I would just use a flannel to wash my armpits and my top half basically for I think for about a couple of weeks. Yeah, until that sounds about right. Two or three weeks. Um, see, some of this stuff, because it's over now and it wasn't that hard, it's weird. I didn't keep like a written diary, which maybe I should have done. Um, you do that for a little while, and you, but you can't wash your hair. Like I, I wasn't raising my arms. That's the one thing they say. It's like, don't lift anything heavy and don't raise your arms. Um, and so I left my hair for a week, which was gross and went for a blow dry at my local salon around the corner and I think a couple of weeks later I felt comfortable enough leaning over the bath and washing it so I felt like the hair thing was was not the nicest because it feels disgusting and then I think three or four weeks later rather than tipping my head over the side of the bath I actually like had a proper shower and it was glorious absolutely glorious um I still worked but I work from home so it's pretty easy but I laid pretty low for about a week and then I went into London to have my dressings changed and there was a work dinner that evening that I decided to go to I was like well I'm in town so I'll go but it was a little bit too soon and I was tired and I also felt a bit uncomfortable after the dressing change I think because the original dressings are quite tight and they're quite big and then you go to steri strips and I think everything sort of relaxed and it felt like they were swelling which they weren't and I was just a bit like oh I just fancy being in my pajamas now but I was with friends I was with with, I was with Alex Light who I like very much, and Newbie Hands, and Alex Steiner was there. And um, I can't remember who said it, but basically someone said, and it was so hilarious, everyone for the main course had um, uh, these lovely big pieces of fish, white fish. And I was chattering a lot and I wasn't eating. And um, somebody said across the table, and they, because they're my mates, I said to them, oh, I'm a little bit tender because I had my boobs done last week. And someone said, for the love of for the love of God, Emma, don't eat the fish. If you choke on a if you choke on a bone, we won't be able to give you the Heimlich. And I just d- just thought that was hilarious. It really made me laugh in the evening. Um that night after I that the night after that, I then presented at my friend Porna Bell's workshop that she does every month. We did a chat about imposter syndrome. But that really was enough. Like when I got to the end of that, I was pooped, so pooped. But I had committed to doing that a long time beforehand, and I certainly wasn't going to let her down. The only time I took paracetamol was about a week after the surgery or like five to seven days after the surgery when I started getting twinges and pangs where nerves were coming back online. But actually, they weren't bad. I sort of took paracetamol because it was like, well, maybe I should. Um, For a little while afterwards, if I sat down for too long or especially in the morning when I woke up, it felt like I was wearing a very tight, rusty wire bra that was digging into me when I stood up. And it took a little while for everything to loosen up. But that's just without being gross, where I'd been sewn back together. It wasn't painful. I just had to move slowly. It was just, and that that really did ease after about four or five weeks. Um, 
Going back a little bit though, when I had my second dressing change two weeks after surgery, I had some weeping from the T-junction on the wound on the left breast. So where the bit goes from the areola to the base of the breast, then you meet that anchor shape. That bit, there's a lot of tension there because it's three bits of skin that have been tied back together, tied back together, sewn back together. Um, And that really, really freaked me out because I had to change my own dressing at home. And it was a very, very bizarre experience. Like the nurse had given me some extra dressings just in case. But you know, it was like, I, I was like, well, nothing in here's clean enough. And so I rushed out and bought some antiseptic whites and antibacterial, this, that, and the other, and some gloves, surgical gloves. But I was taking my bra off. It's like something out of the, the hurt locker and sort of my hands were shaking and trying to take off strips and clean the area. And then the actual breast at that point felt like frozen chicken breast like slightly thawed out but still the majority of them frozen chicken breast and they were quite cold and then that was really weird so it was just that was a yeah that was a lot um but that that didn't I think that lasted about five days and when I say weeping it just meant I had to change the dressing every day and just make sure it was clean and it was fine but that is when I did stop and there were some friends who I had told who said don't you think you should be resting a bit more? But this, the weeping from that T-junction made me stop, do a lot of reading and just really dial myself down. And I do want to say something about recovery, which is something I wasn't expecting. It's important not to overdo it, but prior to having done this, I was exercising a lot so that I was fit for surgery. Um, so I was running a lot. I mean, if you follow me on Instagram, you was, you would have seen that I was doing lots of runs and sharing them and like, I'm in the park again, all that kind of stuff. And for me, exercising is something that if I'm not doing it, I'm on a downward spiral to weight gain. Now, admittedly, that's a much bigger topic for another time, but it's part, it was part of my hard wiring to think I had to move every day. So getting up in the morning and getting straight into the shower felt like those days when I was depressed and had no energy and couldn't exercise. It looked the same as how my days were when I was depressed, which is get up, shower, don't really put on any makeup because you're not going anywhere. Sit down, do nothing, watch TV, read, maybe answer the odd email. Like it all was a little bit too freakishly familiar. But I knew that the cause was different and I knew they were different, but it did make me feel quite wobbly for about for about a week. I just felt a bit... I felt like it's something looming. I've, I've just had this sort of weight, a black cloud over me. And it's something I mentioned to my nurse and she said it's not uncommon to feel a bit low, not only after surgery, but during the recovery. So I was able to sort of compute it and think, well, this is all going to pass and it won't be long before I can exercise again. But I do, I want to be really honest with you just in case, if you do go ahead with something like this, that it's something that can happen. And actually... I tried to just power through during this phase and I did an Instagram live and some lovely followers DM'd me saying they thought I seemed a bit flat and they hoped I was okay, which is very sweet of them because actually it made me feel a lot brighter. I saw my surgeon again at seven weeks to check everything was as it should be and I was extremely cheered when the reaction was, well, they look fantastic. I was like, great, never had that reaction before, thanks. (laughs) Um, I went back to exercising at six weeks, but I went back to, I've been walking like going for like very gentle hour long walks, like four or five times a week. But, um, I tried to run and it felt like, it felt like the weirdest thing. I was like, Oh my God, my first run is going to feel so free and light and bouncy and wonderful. And it felt like, it felt like wearing high heels to Glastonbury or like getting a beautiful, your car beautifully cleaned and valeted and then taking it down a mud track. It's like, why would I bounce these bad boys now? But maybe that's just a short-term thing. Maybe other people who've had breast surgery can um, attest to the fact that you sort of feel like you have to... Running feels a bit weird afterwards. So I've just been doing other exercises and I'll just put a pin in running for now. So that's the experience side of it. And I hope that's useful for anyone considering any kind of cosmetic surgery. But let's talk about something very, very important, perhaps the most important part of all of this. And I've said that I'm in the fortunate position of having friends who know the best of the best when it comes to cosmetic surgeries and aesthetic procedures. So all I had to do to find the best um, or know like who some of the best were was to ask a friend whose whose professional opinion I trusted. If that hadn't been my situation, this is what I would want to know and this is what I think you need to know. 
ask your GP for good surgeons local to you. It's completely legitimate to go and say, I'm thinking about having this surgery. Who is in the area that you would advise, who you think is great, who can give me the result that I want? Completely legitimate. Speak to your GP. Word of mouth is an excellent way of doing it. So ask friends who you know have had the same procedure. Personal recommendations are always incredibly strong. The consultation I had five years ago was with the surgeon who had done um, breast augmentations on a couple of friends of mine. And he did beautiful work. (laughs) But he also did reductions and lifts. And so I went to see him as well. And And I would have felt very happy going with him. It just, you know, at that point, it sort of all petered out. Um, also, as I've said earlier on in the show, check that whoever you are seeing is a member of BAPRAS or BAPS, B-A-P-R-A-S or B-A-A-P-S. Make sure they have that certification. And ask to see, although they'll likely show you, the before and afters of their previous work and find people who have the same sort of issue that you're trying to fix and look at their before and afters with the most attention. I think that's uh, the best resource and then also the BAAPS actually has an excellent resource on their website where you can search geographically for a surgeon that has the certification and is obviously registered etc so I'll put the link to that in the show notes and also to be clear I'm not advocating that you have surgery I'm not saying yeah I've done it let's all do it although obviously I am delighted with the choice I made But I am saying that if you are going to do it, these are the best resources I can share with you to help you find the right surgeon so you can be confident you're moving forward positively. And I know you're going to ask me about scars, but it's a bit too early to really talk about how mine are progressing. I'm four months post-op and they are still very visible, but I'm also olive skinned and prone to pigmentation. So that's to be expected. As I said earlier, I have a band of pigmentation under my boobs anyway from wearing tight bras. My, my skin reacts to that with pigmentation. I, mass- I do massage my breasts and scars every night with either bio oil or Botanica Vida Omega oil. And I'll put the links to both of those in the show notes. And I'm currently using Remascar, the stick, every day morning and evening on the scars and it's my favorite so far I just find it's like a tiny little deodorant solid stick that you just or like a fat lip balm that you just draw over you don't have to massage in or use a lot of pressure you just put them over the top and I've also been using heel gel both of those are silicone based and silicon is the ingredient you want to look out for when treating scars so again I'll put the links to those in the show notes I'm not bothered by my scars at all because when I look at my breasts, I see the shape and size and I know other people who've had breast reductions, breast lifts feel, and have the anchor scar, you know, all around the areola, the line down and then along the bottom. I know all of them feel the same way. I may explore some lasering down the line if I feel as though they need a little help. But right now I'm just happy to use these topicals. I did use silicon tape for a while but I found it a bit fiddly and it would rub against my bra. And actually, it's worth saying, it's a little uncomfortable wearing bras to begin with. So I wore crop tops for a while, which is very weird because I've never not worn underwired or like, you know, big proper boulder holders. And so to just like go out wearing a crop top was so bizarre. I was so underdressed, but I was going to things in my pajamas. Um, but yeah, the silicon tape sort of gathered and like certain bits would come away. And if I got hot, they, it wouldn't stick. Um, and it was quite expensive so I thought well I prefer Remiscar so there we go so there we are I hope we've covered everything in terms of the technical so what actually happens the practical which is what you need to know how much it costs what you need to do what you can expect and how long it takes to get back to normal and the emotional the fear the coming to terms with the newness of your body of your new body parts (laughs) and how the recovery isn't bad but can feel a little wobbly And I know we've talked about how to find a surgeon and there may be those of you who are curious who my surgeon was. So if you do want any recommendations, then please email me at thebeautypodcast at gmail.com or you can DM me on Instagram and Twitter where I am at Emma Guns. And I'm sure we'll be having a discussion about this in the Facebook groups and the link to join the Facebook group will be in the show notes, which can be found wherever it is that you are streaming and downloading this episode. Wow. What, yeah, what a big... What a big thing to do. And thank you. Thank you. if You've made the end of this show. Um, It was such a big decision. I feel very, very good about it. And I'm really delighted to now be able to share it with you. Because like I said, when I've mentioned it in passing before, it's been something that a lot of people have messaged me about for whether it's 
to say they would like to do it or to say they've done it and they really highly recommend I pers- I do it because they know if I'm that sad about it it will make me happy so um but it's not just about my experience I really hope that in doing this whether it's this kind of surgery or any kind of cosmetic procedure or any kind of procedure you want to have done that you're a little fearful of it could be um laser eye surgery for example I remember a friend of mine had it done and said and she just said to me they fix it you go in and you come out and it's fixed and the people like oh but I wouldn't want to do this and I wouldn't want to do the other and she's like you don't think about that they just you go in they do it you're fixed and um it's sort of hopefully laying out the sort of what it's like realistically but also um Everything you need to know is that you can go in knowing that you've made a good decision and you know that you're doing, you've done all that you can, you've done your due diligence and you can, you've done all that you can to get the best result for you. That's what I want for you to get out of this is that if you're going to make this kind of decision, I hope hopefully these are all of the building blocks and all of the things you need to know, the steps you need to take to get the best results, to have the best experience possible that you can have. That's what I want from this show. And forgive me for being self-indulgent and talking about my experience, but it's just to give you a little bit of color um, along the way. Thank you so much for listening and thank you so much for all of your support. Um, It means such a lot to me. Everyone who's ever supported me and sent me messages saying, do it, you'll be so happy because I am. And it's so nice of you to send those messages. So thank you. And um, get in touch, thebeautypodcast at gmail.com. Slide into my DMs on Instagram and Twitter where I am at Emma Guns. Or join that Facebook group. It's such a lovely place. It's the best of social media. I really would love to see you there. Thank you so much for listening. I will see you on the next one, which as it's a December daily, is tomorrow. Um, Stay well and I'll speak to you soon.